Good afternoon and welcome to the first CodeMonkey teaching experience. Today we are going to learn how to teach CodeMonkey in the classroom to look forward to doing so. One of the best parts about our platform is that as a teacher you don't need to have any prior experience coding to be able to teach it to your students. The CodeMonkey platform will give you all of the tips and tricks that you need to teach coding seamlessly to your students. Remember, coding is not just for one, but for all. Your first steps with CodeMonkey. So let's just start off with who I am. So my name is Lena Saleh, and I am the Professional Development Manager here at CodeMonkey. I am a former STEM teacher. I taught in the classroom, um, as well as I was the T in STEM. So basically what that means is I wrote scope and sequence for my district and really developed the coding um, curriculum and kind of what that looked like from K through 12. Um, I also basically helped teachers with any part of T that they needed. If they wanted to make a movie or a stop motion film or any of those things, that's what I helped them do. Um, I'm a professional development leader, and so basically what that means is that I've taught in-person and online workshops um, prior to my experience actually here at CodeMonkey. I've taught at a couple STEM conferences and just some different places around the country. Um, I'm also an EdTech Austin organizer. So here in Austin, uh, meetup groups are a really thriving um, part of the culture here. And so I am one of the organizers of EdTech Austin. And so that basically means we take the merriment of the EdTech companies. There's quite a lot of them here in Austin, as well as teachers. And we kind of marry the partnership amongst both of them, um, following some of the trends and needs that we see in the community. I've been in education for well over a decade, even when I was in high school, I was going back and working inside of classrooms. I would uh, try to do as much tutoring as I could and really just wanted to get as much exposure as I could to education because I always knew from a very young age that I wanted to be a teacher and I wanted to learn as much as I could, as fast as I could essentially. Um, and something else about me is that I'm just really passionate about computer science. Um, I, um, coming from a family that isn't really uh, college educated, um, I didn't really know anything about computer science. I thought it was just something that the boys did, or um, I didn't really have much exposure to what was available to me as a career choice or a career pathway. And when I left the classroom, I walked in and it was a very traditional setting and it was, um, it was actually kind of sad to me. And so. I went to a training actually with a co.org. I was like, oh, look at this really cool thing. And I fell in love with computer science. And ever since then, I've just been extremely passionate about it. I've taught myself to code, um, back end and both front end, um, as well as my students started surpassing me and I knew I needed to do something different. And um, so that's kind of where my passion came from. All right, so here are our objectives for this webinar today. Um, we're going to learn what CoffeeScript is, how to run a lesson in your classroom using CodeMonkey, how to work your way through solving uh, CodeMonkey challenges, but up to challenge 15 is what our main focus will be of the day. Um, what is skill mode, why we use it, how do we keep track of students' work, and um, because this is a pre-recorded, we're not going to really do too much on the Q&A part of it, um, but that's just, the, just an option usually we do with most of our webinars. What language, so let's just start off with um, first, what language do my students code in? So if you, you should already at this point kind of know what CodeMonkey is, but if you don't know, um, CodeMonkey is you program in a language called CoffeeScript. And CoffeeScript is a real recognized computer language. Uh, the golden rule of CoffeeScript is that it's just Java. Basically what that means is that it's straightforward, it's easy to use, there's no messy syntax. If you've ever done any programming or ever seen it yourself, and if you haven't, I would just recommend kind of maybe just taking a peek in Gander at just so you can kind of have an understanding. Um, but basically, uh, CoffeeScript is the entree. So think about like a steak dinner. So CoffeeScript is your steak and you don't want to have dinner all by itself. Just have a steak. You usually have potatoes or a side salad or whatever. Those are all the, those are what I would call the syntax. So there are things that sur surround the content of the language itself. So the challenges that we're going to be looking at today are challenges 0 through 4, 5, 11, 14, and 15, and that's where we'll stop today. Um, so let's just talk about um, some teaching tips on how to actually teach CodeMonkey and how to really just kind of introduce it to our um, students. So to do so, we're going to need to go into the actual CodeMonkey platform. So let's go ahead and get started. And, 
And prior to doing so, I don't really, um, I'm not going to introduce my students to the platform until um, I'll kind of discuss what that is later, but I'm going to log in here under my demo account called Miss Birdie. And um, I just really want the students to have an ease and comfort with the platform and kind of ease and coding with coding before I just set them free inside of the platform because we all know the kids are going to figure it out but I want them to be able to feel that certain level of success so let's talk about what that looks like so here I am on the code monkey um, homepage I logged in under my demo account Miss Birdie um, and as I scroll down you can see I have some active classrooms we'll talk about what that is we'll also talk about if you have any questions about how to set up your classroom or where the teacher resources are located and all of that we'll touch back on that um, but the nice thing about CodeMonkey is that you have access to all of the same courses that your students have access to. So what that means is you can code in real time alongside your students. This is really great to get you just as excited about coding as your students and it's a quick and fun way for you to learn too. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to click on Coding Adventure Part 1. Um, our course is just recently split into three. So we have Coding Adventure Part 1, Coding Adventure Part 2, and Coding Adventure Part 3. Um, we change this based on um, some of the needs of our teachers and just kind of how we were receiving feedback. We just felt that it, it was better manageable um, in three sections rather than two um, large courses. So here we are. Um, I just clicked on Coding Adventure. And as you can see, I've already actually completed this course, but I'm going to click Redo the course. So if that happens to you, it'll at least say Redo or Begin Coding or that. Um, we just launched this new narration feature. For right now, I'm just going to click out of this. I'm going to turn down the sound because the sound can get quite loud. I'm going to leave the sound on just a little bit lower for us. Um, all the To get to that control, I just clicked on the gears here. You can change the game speed. I like my game speed to be faster. Um, I don't really have the patience necessarily for the slower, time, uh, slower game speed, but a lot of other people do. So it's kind of up to you and your preference of what you feel most comfortable. So as you can see, we're taken here to challenge number 75, and this is pretty challenging. So that's not where you'd want to start with your students. So the very first thing I start on challenge number zero. What I do is I tell students that we're going to begin coding. I will actually start by playing this trailer, and so it's super cute. Um, the kids really like it, and it really gives them that buy-in into the game. And so um, basically what happens is that gorilla comes over and basically steals monkey's bananas, he cries, and that's how the game starts. Like I said, super cute, and um, that definitely a thing that you want to go with your students. So um, something about this is that this is our directions. I'm just going to click out of the directions for now, and then I'll refer back to how we kind of get there. Like I said, this is a narration tool. It will read the text back to you. So um, in case you have students that are struggling readers or maybe uh, learning English or any of that kind of con that that's there for you as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring my students to wherever your teaching um, area is. Even with my fifth graders when I taught fifth grade um, this last year um, I kind of had a space on the floor. Um, I wasn't lucky enough to have the primary grades with the um, big carpets but I have used those in years past and so what I do is I bring all the students down and I step away and I put one of my students in the driver's seat. And so in this case, I really like to bring up a student who usually is a girl. She's not, um, she's not, a, she's not a coding superstar. We don't want a coding superstar. You don't want a coding superstar. And I'm just going to um, mute these sounds for right now. You can leave the narration on for now. Um, but basically, I don't want to bring up a coding superstar. You don't want to bring up a coding superstar because you want the students to know that you believe in them. And if you always are bringing up that student that knows everything or knows it all, you know that the students start to lose faith in themselves and they think that you don't trust them the same as you trust the student who's a rock star at everything. So like I said, I'll bring up a girl. I'll have her solve the first two to three challenges. And I want a girl that the students still trust. They still, you know, they... They trust that she will answer the right things, but she's not going to be the strongest person in the class. And so I'm just going to step away. And in this case, for me, it's Jessica. And Jessica's going to be in the driver's seat. And I'm going to step back and I'm going to take an inquiry role. I want to take an inquiry role because, like I said, I want the students to know that um, if you've ever met a computer programmer themselves, they actually um, go on um, sprints and they're constantly, if you ever even look at the memes by themselves, they'll um, basically show you that a lot of times the computer programmers don't understand why something works or why it doesn't work and they're constantly failing, what I like to call failing forward. Um, so it's okay if they make a mistake. 
then nothing happens. But we want to know, it's basically the failing forward. So what do they do with the mistake that happens? So anyway, Jessica's sitting in the driver's seat. And I, at this point, really for me, I don't care if other kids are chiming in, but I um, kind of train my students a little bit that if a student is um, kind of sharing out their answers, um, I want Jessica in the driver's seat to maybe ask them, okay, well, why do you think that? Um, because, you know, most of the students will kind of figure it out and kind of go with the flow, but sometimes you have some other students that have some other ways of solving it. We kind of want to, maybe they have a new way that we never thought about before. So Jessica's sitting in the driver's seat, and as you can see here, monkey's arm is basically saying something. And so in this case, we say, okay, she's going to figure out that she needs to do something because monkey doesn't move on his own. And so she clicks run, and hooray, success. And so there's a really cool um, sound, and we'll all open up the sound for this next one. And I just want you to know that this is a three-star solution for how we solve this answer. I'll talk a little bit more about what that looks like. Um, and then Gordo is our little TA. He gives little tips and tricks kind of along the way, um, directions and some encourage, encouraging features right here. So now we're going to go on to our next challenge. And I, like I said, Jessica's still in the driver's seat. I'm going to have her quickly click out of the directions in this case because I want her to try to figure out, okay, what to do. So like I said, I'll just turn on this rather low just so you can kind of hear uh, the sound. Um, so she's going to need to figure out something. And maybe she decides she wants to click run like she had done in the last time. And she'll see, oops. And so this will give um, essentially tips kind of where the students are um, in the on the editor. So we have, like I said, in the white spot, the editor on the, the right hand side. And then we'll see the actual game running on the left hand side. Text editors look very similar to this where they have something happening on one side and something running on the other. Sometimes they're flipped directions, but it doesn't really matter. So she's going to say, okay, yeah, um, he didn't run fast enough. And so this is telling us to do something and she might figure out, okay, the directions told me to step 15. Or she might see this ruler and say, hey, I want to use that and figure out that I need to do some measurement alongside of there. So then she clicks that and she feels success and yay. And so the stars... Um, really just get the students excited as well as these noises. They love the noises and that's great. We want them to be just as excited about coding as we are. So let me go to the next challenge and um, here is the introduction of the ruler. Um, and so if she hasn't used the ruler in, in the previous challenge, she might be seeing that this is demonstrating. And so at this point, all the kids are getting excited. Step, step, step. We know you need a step. And so she'll see here that you can't just step zero. She's going to need to make a change. And so she follows the directions. And hopefully all the students are chiming in at this point and getting super excited. She's going to say, okay, we need to step 20. And she's going to see, see kind of what that success looks like. I'm going to reap replay this for you just really quickly. So let's say that uh, Jessica didn't change this first one and she decided to type it out. And she decided to type it out in this way. Let's take a look at kind of what happens here. So we'll notice this was only a one star solution. And this is a one star solution because it instead of taking um, a much shorter pathway of step 20, which is a three star solution, we see that Jessica had to basically span out. So it wasn't the shortest, most concise way. Now, did she get the banana? Absolutely. But she didn't get it in the shortest way possible. So at this time, you could talk about that, or we can just kind of keep going to kind of recognize kind of what that looks like. And we could resolve this and say, okay, Jessica, we really, I really want you to try to get three stars in this solution. And then hopefully she can see, okay, I need to be doing this and feel that sense of success. So now Jessica's come up, the students are getting pumped about this activity. I'm going to bring up another student, and this student is Luis. Luis is, um, sorry, I meant to click go to the next challenge. So if that happens to you, just go ahead and you can click three or you can click run again. Um, I just kind of type that into the browser. And so this time I'm going to bring up Luis. And Luis has been watching, he's been sitting in the audience, and the students are also super jazzed. And Luis is um, a non non-native English speaker. Um, he still kind of struggles with reading concepts and that's okay because um, he can figure this out without needing to be the most, without needing to be the strongest reader in the classroom. And so if he needs to, he can read out their narration tool for Gordo or for himself. And so the student can figure out fully from watching Jessica the last two times. He sees that he needs to run it. Oops. 
we are actually doing a debugging here. So there's code here, but something is wrong with our code. And so Luis is going to figure out that he's going to need to change that to that. Challenge four and five are very similar. They're just turning the other direction. And so Gorda tells us, um, you wrote your first code that was longer than one line. And so then we move on to the next um, challenge here. And I'm going to let him continue. And here it introduces the buttons that type it out for you, so the actual step feature. And so I'm hoping, we hope that Luis and the class will figure out that they need to hit run first and then figure out, okay, what is the distance? And so in this case, we do that and they celebrate and woohoo, we celebrate there. And so at this point, we've solved challenges zero through four together as a class and we've had some celebration. So now we get to challenge number five. Challenge number five is the first time where students are writing basically more than um, one line of code, but where they're actually seeing an algorithm. So let's talk about what an algorithm is. And now that we've kind of heard all of our sounds, I'm just going to turn this off here. Um, just, you know, keep it on, however. So now we saw challenge, challenges zero through four. We saw them together with the class, everyone on the carpet. Basically, remember, this is an algorithm. It's the first time we're seeing an algorithm in challenge number five. So let's talk about what is an algorithm. An algorithm is a recipe. So think about making uh, cookies. You have the cookie dough batter, and you put the cookies in the oven, and although they taste delicious before going in the oven, they're, when they come out, there's something entirely different. Cookies, and um, so they look different than when they came in, when they went in, than when they came out. So that's what we call an input output. So you put something in and you get something out. So what I would do at this point is I would show this video to my students about what an algorithm is and, ha and have a discussion as a class about what an algorithm is. So I found this really great video that I love, just an extra resource um, that I play with my students, and so I'm going to let you go ahead and listen to this now. If we want a computer to understand how to do something, we need to give it an algorithm. Pick up, brush. Algorithm sounds like a big word, doesn't it? Actually, an algorithm is something very simple and not important. Pick up, toothbrush. An algorithm is a list of steps we give to computers to solve a problem or get something done. Imagine that you need to show someone how you brush your teeth so they can learn how to do it themselves. You need to explain all the little steps you do in the right order so they can understand how to do it without getting confused. The instructions would go like this. 1. Put a toothpaste. 2. Put a bit of toothpaste on the toothbrush. 3. Open your mouth. 4. Brush your teeth nicely. 5. Pinch your mouth with water. 6. Smile. It is important to explain the right steps in the right order so you can get Results. So as we can see, that's what an algorithm is. So an algorithm is when you put something in, you get something out. And at this time, usually I'll have the students talk about, okay, what is your steps for getting ready in the morning and kind of talking that out. And so now that we've done um, challenges zero through four together, I will release them to do challenge number five and solve this challenge. So we could definitely solve this challenge together, but let's take a look at some of the other resources that are available to us um, to basically figure out, okay, how is this happening? So I'm gonna go back. So I'm gonna go back to my main teacher dashboard, and to do so, I can click on the three lines here and click home, or I can click on the code monkey icon at any time. And so now I'm back here and now I want to go into my classroom. So get to get to my active classrooms, I click see my classroom. If you're not sure how to create a class, how to um, add your students, um, this is really, we have some really great resources, which I'll show you at the end that will help you with all of those things. So don't get stressed about it. You can also reach out to the CodeMonkey team at any time to help you with any of these um, options. So I click on Miss Birdie's class. When I clicked in Ms. Birdie's class, you can see I already have students. Um, if you want to know about the print login cards or the classroom URL, um, we're happy to show you that um, later on as well, too. But I'm going to skip right along to the progress page. And the progress page is probably my most favorite when I was teaching, but also teachers' most favorite. We hear that this is probably the best feature of CodeMonkey. 
um, outside of obviously the coding part, but this is one of the best teachers, uh, teacher tools for you that make your life so much easier. So let's talk about why that is. So first you see students here are populated in to in here by name. You can sort them by name or by progress. Uh, let's talk about the solutions and let's talk about some of the really cool um, components here. So I showed you what a one star solution is and a one star solution means that you were able to basically catch all of the bananas. A two star solution means you were able to catch all the bananas and use what you learned. And a three star solution means you were able to um, solve the challenge using the shortest, most concise code possible. Remember when we had step zero, step 10, step 10, that was a very long way of saying step 20. And so that's why we, a three star solution was step 20 and a one star solution was the step zero, step 10, step 10. And sometimes the students will do this. Um, nothing wrong with that, but there's always encouragement for them to basically grow a little bit. Okay, so now that we know that, um, all of the circle, yellow circles are assessment challenges. We'll take a look at what that looks like. And then anything where you ever see a black line with an explanation inside of it basically means that the student just didn't understand. It was not able to pass that on their own. So what we see here is along the, along the top, these, I like to call them units, but really they're coding concepts. The coding concepts match uh, the story mode, which we'll kind of talk about that. We'll go back into the um, coding adventure course here in just a minute and I'll kind of talk a little bit more about that but basically this is um, each one of these is a unit so the very first one stepping and turning is basically just an introduction it's exactly what it says there learning how to step and learning how to turn the most beautiful part about this is that all of these green numbers along the top are your solution so remember how I said okay let's solve challenge number five I can click on number five and I can see what the three star solution is so this is great for showcasing this with your students not to mention, so I can see the three star solution, but not to mention that I can also, as students are solving this in real time, it's showing me their progress right here in real time. I don't have to do any grading. There's nothing that's making it extra hard for me um, because at the end of the day, I cannot see what all of our students are doing at once. So I'm last year, my class size was 25. It was very impossible in a computer lab or even with them sitting with Chromebooks at their desk for me to see what every student was doing, this is the way that I can. Then I can say, okay, this student is struggling. Now I need to go in conference with them. So that's the that's why this is so beautiful. The assessment challenges are all, like I said, listed here in yellow. The solutions are here for you as well. Skill mode also reports in the same way. Another feature that's super awesome here is the limit progress. And so, so I would get my students logged in and what I would do is I'm going to limit their progress. Now, as you can see, after challenge number five is now grayed out. That means that once the students get past challenge number five, or they cannot go anywhere further beyond that. I have limited them. I have limited them because I want to know that they're able to master that algorithm um, before I move on to the rest part of our lessons. Also, the very first lesson covers challenges zero through five. And so that's just a way to make sure I ensure for myself that my students are on the same pace that I want them to. And hopefully we're seeing some success from the students solving zero through four that they're really able to challenge, tackle challenge number five solo. Those are the really awesome parts about the progress bar. I always call it the progress bar, but it's really the progress page. And in the progress page, like I said, it is a teacher's best friend. You can also export data. If you're not sure how to do that, remember we're always here to help you with any of those parts. All right, let's go back to our main page here and let's kind of get moving. So we took a look at what an algorithm was. We just talked about what some of the features are in the progress page or progress tab. Um, you can access the skill mode and remember it's reported in the same way as the gradebook. Now let's talk about the unplugged activities and then we'll go into what, what skill mode is. So day one, I introduced the lesson and I let the students, we solve it together basically as a class and they solve challenge number five independently. Day two, I open with an unplugged activity. So I usually start out with this activity on the board doing something whole group. I just feel like um, usually when you're able to do something for me, obviously, remember, you can take anything that you want from this, but these are just some ways that I found that really, really work. Um, so I will paste something together just to kind of get their brain working a little bit. Um, so here on this one, I'll showcase this. 
and I showcase it with the grid lines on the back because I really want the students to understand that each square is a step. So we use what we learned from yesterday and we talk about or from the previous day or whatever is working with your schedule. So how does student A get to the ball? So we're going to make sure we use the terms from the day before. Step, turn right, and turn left. So the very first thing that the students are going to remember from yesterday is that in order for um, monkey or the student A to move, they need to face the direction of which they walk. So the student will need to turn right first, and then if we count these steps, it's turn six, and then when they get here to the corner, they'll need to turn left and then step the complete distance to eight. All the while I'm dictating this code on the board, or maybe I have student, a student write that on the board, or sometimes I'll have them, depending on my class and their needs, I'll have them dictate it um, on a whiteboard, personalized whiteboard, or for me I didn't have whiteboards, they just wrote right on their desks. I also remind them is that it's an algorithm because what did we have to do? We had to plan how we got to the end. Not to mention we wrote, we just did easily four lines of code and so the students can now see the correlation between something that's unplugged and plugged in. Another great um, unplugged coding example that I love to do with teachers and I love to do with students, it's probably my most favorite thing, is to do an activity whole group. So once again I bring all my students down to the carpet and I basically set up two desks or two tables or basically whatever is in your classroom. And I put one bowl on one table and one bowl on the other. And I'll bring up three students. One to dictate the code on the board, one to be the direction giver, and one to be blindfolded. So the student before being blindfolded will see that on the table nearest to him, there is or her or who, whatever student you choose. For me, when I do it with teachers, I fill it with beads. It's just easier for me when I travel to conferences. But um, when I do it with students, I usually, um, for me last year, my kids were super jazzed about unicorns. And so I had a bowl full of unicorn erasers. It's just a really good incentive uh, at the end to um, give them something that they're interested in. I've seen teachers use um, chocolate candy. And there's really, really, there's no... Um, there's a no rule of what you use. So use whatever you think your students will want to have. The goal is, is that the student is going to take this bowl or cup or whatever it is that you have, and they're going to be given directions to go to the other bowl and dump it in, and that's how they reach the end. So the student will be blindfolded. Now they've seen where it is. And the other student that's a direction giver will need to give really clear directions. So we say that beforehand. Like if it's going, if the student's going to walk two steps, we're going to make sure that prior we set this up that is going to be walking heel to toe. So two heel to toes as a student is dictating. And so what the very first thing that you'll notice, even yourself at nighttime traveling um, in any kind of dark space, is the very first thing you do is you put out your hand. This is actually an if statement. If something is not there or if something is in the way, I'm not going to continue walking. And so they'll, you'll kind of note that, and you can talk about that after as a reflection piece, like, oh, this is a really great if statement, if something was not there, and you can refer back to it in further lessons when the students do get to the if statements, actually. So the student will be blindfolded, everyone's going to be super jazzed, wanting to give directions. Oftentimes, depending on my class, I'll also have the students in the audience kind of dictating their own code, just so that they're also writing the lines of code. This too is an algorithm, because there's lots of planning involved with getting one person who's blindfolded to the other side using only words. Um, so this is a really fun one and a really great way to open up day two. Now that we've talked about how we start out the lesson, let's take a look at what skill mode is and why skill mode is an important feature. I'm gonna go back to coding adventure, um, part one, because remember this is the only part of our focus today. Remember this is going to take us right to the end, but how do we navigate? We click on the story map over here, or the story icon, and it brings us to the story map. And so you can scroll quickly by doing the double arrows or scroll between the worlds or between the concepts right here. So we start out at the very beginning, and so here we see our first steps or stepping and turning. Now, how do you access skill mode and why is skill mode important? You access skill mode from the story map, and it'll be right here. It's also now accessible from the main from the main screen. I'll show you that in just a moment, but you can really access it here. So what is skill mode and why is skill mode important? In my opinion, and in some of the teachers that I've talked to um, that have used it and not used it. So they've used CodeMonkey for a few years and they've used it the first year, they didn't feel like it was very important, and then they really realized for the second year. So what is skill mode? It reinforces what the student needs to know um, each set of skill mode assumes that the student has already had some depth of understanding. So basically it's just a reinforcement of skills and concepts and so, um, or extra practice. 
What I find is that I do um, support on Fridays and sometimes some other days during the week. And what I find is that students who, um, the majority of students who reach out to us are students that have not used utilize skill mode to its fullest potential. And what I mean by that is, um, if you notice, what I mean by that is that students are not actually um, utilizing to its full potential, meaning that after they get done with a concept, so at the very end of first steps, once they get to challenge number 10, skill mode will open up for them. So the first steps of skill mode. So each skill mode is associated to the um, set of concepts. So here the students will actually practice. So what does skill mode look like? First, skill mode is in a black editor. More times than not, skill mode doesn't have anything um, written inside of it. Basically, as you can see here, we have monkey, but we have monkey that we need to do some planning for an algorithm. So they need to have taken what they've learned and now apply it. Skill mode is also really great if you have a student like I had last year. Um, my student Brian was super fast at everything. Um, he always, he would surpass everyone. That's just who he was, just the nature of him. And so he would be, if I let him go, he'd be on challenge number 75 and I would have Sally and Lucy on challenge number one, or I'd even have John and he'd be on challenge number five, and we'd ha I would have students all over. I would A, limit his progress in the progress page or progress tab, and then I would have him do some extra reinforcement of skills here in skill mode. And so this is where the like extra enrichment piece comes in or extra practice. And you solve it the same way we've solved all of our other challenges. And now we're gonna start, start talking about um, object-oriented programming and take a look at our lesson plans. So here we are, and I'm gonna to go to challenge number 11. You can shortcut is just type that there in the URL. And this says, turn to will make the monkey turn to an object. So this is the first time that we see here, but in this case, the monkey is now not turning 180 degrees or turning left. The monkey is actually gonna to turn directly to the banana. We see here that monkey is turning to the banana. So we're gonna, have, so we can see that the monkey gets the banana. So this will be a two star solution. Remember, to get a three star solution, the student would need to have written step 20 rather than step 10. So now we've seen solution, what a one star solution will look like, a two star solution, and a three star solution. Let's take a look at the lesson plan so we can kind of get an idea. So I'm actually just going to open this up in a new tab so I can easily navigate back to it. Um, I haven't pre-downloaded lesson plans because I wanna show you how to get to them and kind of how that works. So here, back on the teacher dashboard, we click on lesson plans, and I'm gonna click on the first set of lesson plans because that matches the first course. Okay, and when I do so, then it will download a PDF version of the lesson plans. And so it'll say um, right here to let you know what lessons are associated, and that's going to match the first coding adventure course. I would highly recommend reading uh, this first page here, just kind of getting used to the lesson plan, and then we're gonna kind of jump right in. So lesson one, as you can see, um, the lessons are broken up into basically two lessons per unit. So stepping and turning will have two, turn two and turtle will have two, and it will continue going on from there. So the very first lesson is just an intro lesson, and the second lesson is a deeper dive. So let's just take a look at our first lesson right off the bat here. And our first lesson, the very first thing will give you basically uh, an intro into what the lesson is going to be about. Then it'll tell you objectives. And so what I did was I have students, um, I had students have like a tech notebook or like a computer science notebook or whatever it is that you want to name. And I had them write out um, these objectives as student learning objectives. So today I will be able to describe and define what coding is and computer programming. I will be able to become familiar with the CodeMonkey platform and I'll be able to complete challenges zero through five on CodeMonkey. I did this because it was a really great way to keep my students um, accountable as well as when they weren't, they couldn't remember what a concept was, I can say, oh, well, did you go and check your tech notebook first? Um, and so what I do with these components, so what the students are actually going to be doing in the lesson, step and turn and understand what a challenge is and understand what copy script is, is I would take these and I would do um, word work with them. So it's a really great way to integrate my literacy into the lesson. And so I would have them talk about what a step is and what a turn is. And I'll, ref I'll show you some really great ways on where you can find that. All of our lessons are common core aligned. We are working on alignment with some other standards. Um, and we are also CTSA, CSTA aligned as well. So our lessons are broken up into three parts. So part one is the introduction, part two is the let's go or the play, and part three is the reflection piece. Part one, more times than not, 
is going to be our um, is basically uh, an unplugged activity. So something that you're doing when you're not plugged in. So in this case, this was just introducing them to the lesson. So you could use what I did, or you can use what directly comes from the lesson. Some years of your first time using CodeMonkey, you'll probably rely heavily on these lessons and then kind of go, um, you know, kind of skim off from there. Obviously, not everything is a be-all, end-all. You use what works for you and what's going to work for your classroom. So the let's go is the play. And so in this one, it told us to play to challenge number five. Also learn what Gordo was and the instructions. The debriefing here will be, or the debriefing, um, what did you do when you were stuck? How do you get three stars? What does that matter? And then, um, like I said, the second lesson will be a little bit deeper dive in which they're learning how to turn left, that kind of thing. Um, so I really highly recommend, um, for me, I printed mine all out um, and I look at them like as in a book just because I like to write notes and that kind of thing. But obviously you kind of do what works best for you. Some people are strictly digital um, and some people kind of go from there on whatever works best for them. So now we've taken a look at the lesson plans. The second webinar, just so you know, is going to do a little bit deeper dive into the lesson plans. I just wanted to give you a sneak peek. So now let's talk about what it means by, um, so we just did the turn to, and now we're doing the object-oriented programming. So object-oriented programming, let's take a look at challenge number 14. You can navigate between the worlds. I just like to quickly um, navigate or using the story map, but I'm just going to do it here. We can see here that this is the first time that we're introducing a new object. So the object has always been Code Monkey or our monkey, and now we're introducing Turtle. So what we need to do is we need to get Turtle, we need to get Monkey to get to Turtle, and Turtle to move so that Monkey can now get these bananas. So the first thing that we would need to do is we need to have him step a certain set of directions. Um, something new that you'll learn out here is that I can I can hit an object and it will type it out for me. We figure out here that we need to get the monkey to the turtle and the turtle, the turtle is stepping 10. So the monkey has been on the turtle's back. Now turtle is our object and now we're orienting him through the program to get to the bananas. And so that's what object-oriented programming looks like. As you can see, CodeMonkey starts off um, pretty basic in a sense, just really getting the students introduced and it goes into some really in-depth concepts and it builds upon it. Um, students can't access challenges earlier than they were meant to. Everything goes in a linear buildup. All right, so now we've taken a look at what object-oriented programming is when we program something other than our monkey in the game. Um, we just learned what step was, what turning was, turning to, so instead of monkey turning left and stepping and turning right and stepping, he can actually turn now to a specific object. Also what turtle step is, so that's making the turtle step. We have to associate who the object is and who's stepping because the game automatically assumes, the game automatically assumes that monkey is going to be doing all of the movement until we say what we want the object to do. Let's take a look at what an assessment challenge looks like. All of the other challenges that we've looked at have already had some kind of code in them. So the students are doing a lot of debugging. Here, it is completely um, empty, meaning that there is no pre-built code loaded in here. Why is this important? Well, knowing how your students are doing and where they're having difficulties is of great importance. And it also allows you to showcase what the students are understanding. And you can share that with parents and any stakeholders and really share it with them and kind of have that celebration of knowledge. I allow my students to work collaboratively on the challenges until they get to the assessment challenges because if they're solving an assessment challenge collaboratively, I never know what they know. Um, this is a chance for me to really understand where the students are and what they're struggling with and then I can check the progress page and I can say, oh, Johnny is struggling. I'll show you what a struggling student looks like because um, we talked about the progress page and I can say, okay, well, this is how this is how they're scoring. So. I mentioned, and I forgot to mention the student part, you can open this back up by clicking free play. So I just went back to the teacher page and clicked on back to the classroom page, clicked on the classroom I wanted and clicked on progress. Um, I mentioned that you can see all of the three star solutions as a teacher, but I forgot to mention that when a student is struggling, so let's say on 15, we can see that Dodo Bird didn't score a three star solution. Well, why is that? So let's click on his star. We can see when he attempted the challenge and we can click on his solution and see, okay, well, why was this? Why was that the case? And remember that we want the shortest, most concise code. And so instead of writing step 15, he wrote step six and step nine. So that's the reason why 
he didn't report back with a three-star solution. So it's a really great way to have those conversations. And remember, if you're running short on time or you're not really sure, you can always check these solutions. They're always available for you. So that's how you can tell where a struggling student is. So we talked about what CoffeeScript was. Remember, a real coding language how to run a lesson in your classroom with CodeMonkey. So hopefully you got kind of an understanding of that. How to work your way through solving a CodeMonkey challenge up to challenges 15. So we went through all of the, we went through some challenges to help you get started. What skill mode is and why do we use it? What is skill mode? It's an extra reinforcement of skills or extra practice. We use it to reinforce the concepts um, to really give the students a deeper level of understanding. How do we keep track of our students' work? That's in the progress page. So we know where to find solutions. What we don't know are where to find the how-to video. So I'm gonna go back to my home page here. So go back to the teacher dashboard. And let's talk about some teacher resources that are available to us. All of our lesson plans are located under the lesson plans tab. They are broken up, Coding Adventure is broken up to three. We have Dota Does Math and we have some other um, lesson plans and things coming soon. Under the Getting Started, there is this Beginner's Guide to Code Monkey, and I highly suggest that if you're struggling on a concept, check the Beginner's Guide. It has about classroom management, um, how to set up your classroom, maybe you need to select a different language, you have different language learners in your classroom. Um, those are really great. Then these coding concepts. Remember how I said I did word work or um, vocabulary work with my students? These coding concepts, which are accessible right under the Getting Started, are great. They have some great vocabulary, so you're not going searching for your vocabulary. I'm very visual, so I prefer to see the visuals, and so I like to draw my vocabulary and write just a couple um, notes, but however it is that you're wanting to go to. So what is this step? Turn left. All of our concepts are right here, um, and we have great graphics to go with them, as well as text to go to them, and students have access to this as well. We also have some um, notes for Hour of Code, so if you're kind of um, wanting to do some like Hour of Code stuff with your students since Hour of Code is coming up, those are there for you. We also have some really great video, video tutorials, how to create a classroom ad your students, how to share a classroom code. These have, start out with a really cute graphic, but they're short and almost all of them are under five minutes, so they're really quick for you to check out. All of our new features are here. Very often we get um, questions about what's going on, um, that kind of thing. You can click on what the new features are and we'll give you a quick summary of what's basically going on. We also have certificates for our student certificates when you can finish Coding Adventure as well as soon to be our, our Code Rush competition. Our FAQ, um, many teachers ask us questions and many of our users and it check out the how-to. We have really great really great answers. What is Coding Adventure? They're really quick and short answers. Of course you can always contact us. Um, Question Corner is probably one of the most underutilized, so student accounts. These are really great because they're conversations usually between Gordo and the teacher kind of understanding what they are. They're really great like little context bubbles. And then we have just some classroom posters and things that are located under this part here. One more thing I wanted to know is these three lines over here is where you can access our blog, contact us, help, um, looking at some features of your account. FAQ is also accessible here as well as home and the My Classroom part or accessing your My Classroom page. So that's where you find all of your lesson plans, your how-to videos. We went over how to find your solutions. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. I know that your time is precious and I hope you found some value today. Remember to um, contact us if you have any questions. Also follow us on Twitter at CodeMonkeySTU and hashtag CodeMonkeyWebinar if you want some to give us some feedback on today. Also follow us on Instagram. Remember to write code, catch bananas, and save the world. Thank you so much for joining us today. Have a wonderful day.